Hello and welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, the show where we help you establish your author brand, increase the size of your audience, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Baroker and I'm here as usual with Jeffrey Poole and Joe Lalo. And uh, we have a great guest for you today, Joshua Dalzell. I hope I said his name right. <laughs> and uh, he does not have a website, I don't think, or uh, much of an Amazon bio, so I can just tell you he's a space opera author. And he's had a has a very popular Omega Force series, and uh, recently he's published his Black Fleet trilogy, the first two books of that. And we are going to try to find out how he's doing so well, and and how to sell more space opera. <laughs> Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thanks. It's good to be here. All right. Well, since I don't know really anything about you, uh, would you mind telling us a little about yourself and how you got started with writing? Uh, sure. Um, I've always had interest in writing, kind of like probably all of us have. Um, I was stationed in South Dakota when I was in the U.S. Air Force when I was 18, 19, and during the winter there's not a lot to do, so I started kind of exploring different projects. In fact, I wrote the first iteration of the Black Fleet trilogy during that time, and uh, it's something I've always kind of pursued and even uh, you know solicited publishers and things like that. And then when I discovered the self-publishing, it was kind of uh, a, an exciting way to try to take control of the career again. And uh, I've been lucky enough to get a little bit of a toehold, and so uh, it's kind of snowballed from there for me. All right, South Dakota. Yeah, I can see where the uh, the winters would keep you indoors, maybe. <laughs> yeah, for months. I think there's a lot of riders in the Seattle area too, just because of the rain. You're not <laughs> right. you're not frozen inside, but yeah. All right. Um. So, like, what? How did you find out about self publishing, and what made you uh, decide was, to go that way? I was working on a different project, and I was actually talking to uh, two different agents, uh, kind of seeing if I could get somebody to get me represented. And uh, my girlfriend had bought me a Kindle for Christmas. It was uh, Christmas of 2011. And I was reading all these great books by B.B. Larson and uh, Vaughn Hepner. And I couldn't understand how these books are 2 dollars I was like, these are fantastic. And uh, it just happened to, I was scrolling down through something, saw a link, said publish with us. And so I started digging in there, and it was kind of a, that was a spark that reignited my passion again for, you know, not just writing, but trying to be published and seeing if maybe I have something to say that people want to read. So it was maybe a little bit of dumb luck, but yeah. So my, my girlfriend, who's my fiance now, still takes complete credit for my career. <laughs> All right. Well, you have to treat her well. Take her out to a few <laughs> dinners there. Uh, could you tell us a little about about your series and, and what they're about? Sure. Um, the first one I did with the Omega Force series, which kind of uh, – I wrote Omega Rising as just something to – try to successfully publish a book, no real expectations, and I end up liking the character so much, I, I blew it up into a series, and it's, I hate to, it's very kind of Guardians of the Galaxy, it's a, a misfit crew of guys that come together, and they each have a unique set of skills, and it's, uh, I kind of modeled it after the A-Team, because I like the old cheesy 80s shows, and it was meant to be kind of empty calories, it's like my popcorn series, it's just fun to read, and when you're done reading it, you can put it aside, it's, it's just, that's it. Um, each book is written episodically, so they're all three-act stories within each. You can actually read them out of order. You'll still kind of get a lot out of it. Um, the second one, second series I did was the Black Fleet trilogy. I took the old story I had done in South Dakota and stripped it down to its bare bones and retooled it and kind of wanted to tell a, a kind of a just a grittier, hard sci-fi story without it being dark or, or kind of depressing. So uh, we're rolling into... I kind of... The second book came out, and that's the, right that peak of that second act, and it's always a hard way to leave once there's a cliffhanger and kind of a uh, depressing ending, so I've gotten a little static for that, so. <laughs> but uh, we're working on the third book on that one now. Yes, yeah, so we, we've talked about before on here how uh, the readers hate the cliffhangers, but they seem to work re really well to sell books. <laughs> yeah, as long as, and that's, uh, the Omega Force series, is in, it's going to be going into its eighth book the end of this year, and so if you use cliffhangers, I would say, you know, if you're going to have a really long-running series, you know, make sure they're good ones. Make sure you got make them hook, because it you get to where I, I have a feeling that readers might just say, you know, what the hell, this guy, and, and walk away from it if it's if they if you run out too long, your cliffhangers are a little too abrupt sometimes. Yeah, I, I use them sparingly, and then I try to get the next book out really quick because I feel pressured. That, that definitely helps. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So well, we usually talk about marketing, as you could guess from the title of our show. But I'd love to kind of start out. You know, I don't think we've really talked space opera in depth on here before. So if we could mm -hmm. ask you a few questions about the state of the genre and, and just your experiences in it. Sure. 
So it seems to be doing pretty well right now. You know, I think people think science fiction and fantasy are always going to be like second string to, or second fiddle, whatever that expression is, to, uh, you know, mystery and thrillers and all that. But uh, I've even heard from an agent last year that they're actually looking for it right now. Do you have any thoughts on um, maybe why it's doing well, or is that just a misconception on my part? I, I don't think it's a misconception. I, I see evidence that it's doing really, really well compared to other genres. Um, I, I'm really not sure why. Maybe it's... Uh, kind of resurgence in popular culture. Uh, you know, it's the geek culture and the gamers and the a lot of the stuff is, is kind of sci-fi based. And so maybe the, and maybe the uh, the availability of the technology, the tablets, has kind of you know brought more readers to the table. Um, but yeah, I've definitely seen uh, like Von Hepner, uh, Nick Webb, all these guys have these books that are in the you know top twenties, top fifties of Amazon. So it's uh, it's definitely feel like it's taking off. I hope it's not peaked out. <laughs> I'm sure it's not. I wonder too if it is. It seems like it's been a while since there's been a really good one on TV. So I wonder if people are kind of looking for going to the books. Yeah, there's, that's true. Um, there's not any kind of real mainstream science fiction right now. I know Sci-Fi Channel's got a couple. They uh, what was that Killjoys and uh, there's the one that comes on after that. I can't. Dark something. Uh, so there's been a couple little kind of half-baked attempts to to do something that's like a Battlestar Galacta, Galactica or Firefly. Right. I'm still waiting for Firefly to, to come back. <laughs> I know. <Yeah>, me too. <laughs> All right. Well, for other authors who are out there listening and maybe have a space opera series or they're thinking of starting one, do you have any tips on kind of what you've learned? Uh, that what, what are people looking for and, you know, what do you think is really, I don't know, popular within the genre right now? Uh, it kind of depends on your story. Um, I know, like with the Omega Force series, I get away with a lot of liberties with the science because it's not a science or technology-driven story. It's about the characters and their interactions with each other, whereas the Black Fleet stuff is a lot more hard science, and I've gotten dinged a couple times because I've had a, you know, misused a, a term or a, a phrase. And so, um, for one, I could... Science fiction and fantasy readers in general are, are usually really smart, so... If you're if you're going to make your story science based, make sure that you you know what you're talking about, or you have your information available, or if you're not going to have it be more hard based, set your rules and stick to your own rules. Don't you know? Don't switch halfway through or, or no you know, no magic fixes. You know because you you back yourself into a corner. That's from what I've seen. That seems to just enrage the readers like nothing else I've ever seen. Yeah, I can see that. I always think of space opera as fantasy in space, but I know some people have different expectations with it. So, <laughs> the, yeah, the term's kind of. I mean, it was. It used to be a pejorative term when it was first coined, and now I, I think it's kind of in a little bit of a state of flux. Nobody really knows what it is. Is it kind of the Star Wars base, like you said, fantasy in space, or is it more the the hard sci-fi stuff? And everybody kind of we all get lumped in together on that. Yeah, I told my mom tonight that we were interviewing a space opera author, and she she's like, I don't I don't know what that is. So maybe even authors are the only ones that actually use that term. I don't know. I don't think we do either. I mean, she actually liked Star Trek and those things, so she's a bit of a geek, but I don't know. All right, last question for me, and I'm going to hand you over to the guys, um, at least for this segment. Do you think it sounds like your Omega Four series is a little light lighthearted? Do you think that's more the way to go, or do you think that kind of grim dark thing is popular or maybe both? Um, I, if you could do both, do both. Uh, like, like I said, I, that was just how I how I went. Um, I've seen both both directions work. I'd say that whatever your whatever your vision is, be be honest with yourself first. Um, if you're trying to chase a trend or follow something or force something, the readers are going to know that. You're, if you're if you're trying to make a humorous thing, but you you don't really write humor well, or or you're having to tell them the, these things are funny, then they're going to know it's it's not really it's not really funny. This he's just chasing a trend. So. All right. Well, I'm going to hand you over to Joe, and then I'll talk to you a little later about marketing. <laughs> Yeah. All right. On the subject of space opera as a term and as a genre, um, what what do you think is like a key element of space opera that differentiates itself from some of the other uh, the sci-fi subgenres? Um, I would have to probably scope is the most basic. I mean, you, when you take a space opera, these big sweeping epics, you know, empires going to war, whole planets being devoured and destroyed. Uh, whereas a lot of other stories are kind of much more on the micro scale, where they're they're kind of straight on a, a couple characters or a couple places, and for every, all the good space opera I've read is, is you know encompasses millions of people and, and you know the, uh, you know kind of dire consequences. So, 
Yep, uh, it's. I'm glad you say that because the next question uh, I have here is I've I have and I've heard a lot of other people compare space opera to essentially the sci-fi equivalent of epic fantasy. Uh, do you think that's like an accurate comparison? Do you think the two work hand in hand? I think it's pretty fair. Um, and honestly, that probably a lot of the tropes and a lot of the a lot of the themes are are really interchangeable when you boil them down and you know you take away either the technology or the magic. You, you kind of still have the same the same systems in place. Yeah, that, that seems to be the case with a lot. I think that's why sci-fi fantasy is so often just a pairing, because you have impossible things happening with two different explanations, either magic or technology. Exactly. Um, the only thing is people move more slowly in, in, in fantasy, because <laughs> yeah. oceans equal equals, you know, interstellar <laughs> space. Um, all right, so you sort of mentioned uh, this earlier, but... Uh, we're talking about scope here, the space opera having a large scope. And you've got multiple many books, so at least I think you said eight books in the Omega Force series. Yeah, well, yeah, seven out, eight, eight written, seven out so far. So. All right. So, um, and you say that they're mostly self-contained, like you can read them even out of order, and it wouldn't be too uh, too detrimental to the story. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, uh, like, do you think that having them self-contained like that is important, or do you think an overarching, uh, like, sort of a a series arc uh, is a useful thing to have as well. Um, the answer would be a little confusing, but probably both. Uh, what I did with the way I structured it, even kind of going back to the the A team analogy, was books one through six were kind of you know season one of the, and they had a, a arc they were following, but each book was its own. You know, a conflict was introduced at the beginning of the book, and it had to be resolved by the end of the book, and so that's kind of what I mean by that. Um, so yeah, in a lot of ways, I mean. That the Omega Force series gets lumped in with space opera, but I I think even by our most basic definition, it may be more accurately described as adventure sci-fi. So. Yeah, um, I've always found that like, broadly speaking, I think that th that's probably the way to go. Uh, uh, when you, especially when you have a very long series, it seems like having written it in a way that people could enter it at any point and still enjoy it. But people who've been sticking with it from the beginning get a little bit extra because of the overall, I want to say, story momentum. Right. Plus, heck, if you're drawing from the A team, the A team had some uh, some overarching arcs that occurred, particularly in the last few seasons when they were. <laughs> oh, I'm not going to geek out on A team. <laughs> it's a valid uh, uh, template upon which to build this sort of thing. Yeah, it was, it was. It was. It was when I was kind of come up with the concept. It was. Uh, it was all about how how fun can you make this without turning it cheesy? Like, what's that that line you can tiptoe across and make it where people still care about the characters and people are still kind of serious, but still be irreverent and fun to read? So, yeah, yeah, um, it's tricky when you write humor, and particularly for something that's not just expressly like a humor book, uh, avoiding it suddenly becoming a farce or a parody. Exactly. Yeah. Um, all right, and. When you're putting a sci-fi series like you're to get yours together, what do you think is the most important thing to, to base it upon? Do you want to have a strong setting or strong characters, or do you think a balance is important? A good balance is important. Um, probably story-specific helps, too. I know Omega Force is very much character-driven, um, whereas the Black Fleet stuff is a lot more of the politics and the settings are much more important to the story and have to be consistent. So they have to be, that was something I had to kind of do a little bit more world building and map it out and make sure that everything's consistent. Whereas Omega Force, kind of the stuff I throw the guys into, I can kind of like, well, I'll just, I'll just make this up and, you know, and and let the story roll that way. You know, it's it's sort of um, it's sort of interesting because you have essentially two sci-fi series of two different, like, flavors, so to speak. And one of them is a little bit more Star Trek, and the other one is a little more Star Wars, it sounds like, where, it's, where Star Trek is a little bit harder science and a little bit more... Well, I'm not sure that that really compares well. But the point is, it's interesting that you can take uh, uh, two different series in two different directions, particularly hard sci-fi and something that's, again, got a strong role with it, and, mm -hmm. and uh, write them equally well. So that's... Congratulations on that. <laughs> Thanks. That's why I've kind of, the end of the Black Fleet trilogy, I wrote book two, and I was I had every intention of rolling into Omega Force 8, but I decided to do book three because I thought, let's let's stay kind of in that mode and consistency. Because switching back and forth was the first time I've ever done that, and it was a bit, it was a bit jarring, so... Yeah, you can your brain can get into the uh, the the, the uh, tone of one while you're writing the other, and that can be really problematic if you're yeah. if you've got a big enough tone clash. 
<laughs> Plus, again, if, you, if you're going to throw in a, a cliffhanger, you want to get the follow-up out quickly, or else there's going to be torches and pitchforks. <laughs> yeah, don't rig the, the death threats. Yep. Um, all right, well, that's what, all I've got now, so I'm going to pass you off to Jeff. All righty. I've just got a couple questions for you there, and one of them we've already gone through a couple of times is whenever people hear the term space opera, myself included, the first thing I think of is Star Wars. So I have a hypothetical situation for you. If you go walking into a Star Wars convention and you tell people that yeah, you you write a lot of space opera, and they say, like, okay, well, you know, what would I like about this? You know, if I like Star Wars, would I like your books? I mean, how would you try and persuade them to say, hey, why don't you go pick up a couple copies of my books? I think you'd like them. How would you convince them? <laughs> well, that's a that's a good one. Um, especially well, with the Star Wars comparison, especially going to a Star Wars convention, uh, at the most base level, you know, do you want to see characters that are fun, and situations that are humorous, and good triumph over evil? Um, that's about as basic as I can make it. But yeah, to try to try to draw a direct line comparison, and convince somebody, uh, I'm not sure how I would do that actually, um, without <laughs> without insulting Star Wars, which I would never do. So. <laughs> Yeah, because one thing I've 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 heard you talk about, and I've seen that your description there, that you know, it sounds like you know you're a mega force, so it just isn't really as you know as serious or dark. Is there's so many people that write some like, really seriously dark stuff there, and I'm always a fan. Of my own my own stuff, I write in you know, a lighthearted fantasy. I always like infusing a lot of humor, make the person laugh there. So it's yeah. definitely encouraging to see some of that. You know, it's kind of like the same lines. Like, let's let's have some fun with this. Let's see how these guys get out of this one sort of thing. So. Yeah, so I definitely like that aspect there. And with regards to your Blackfeet trilogy, it kind of ties into my other question here. There's there's a lot of sci-fi fans out there, especially Trekkies and whatnot, that I don't know how they do it, but they've got like blueprints to the ships, to the weapons, everything. I'm like, this is all made up stuff. How would they possibly get this? So it made yeah. me start wondering there that these people that you know like like you that create these type of stories that are really hard science, are yeah. you like fabricating your own version of science, your own laws of science, or you're like applying it to what you already know or maybe influenced by other movies? Um, I mean, how do you actually come up with the science that you know that your stories are based on? For the uh, for the Black Fleet stuff, uh, I actually spent it was probably good three or four months researching things uh, like the the main engines are based on uh, the magnetoplasma rockets from Ad Astra. It's a it's a theoretical engine that they think can work, and so I I kind of drew everything out on a whiteboard and drew lines of evolution in 400 years. Where would these be realistically? You know, would there be big advances or would they be small advances? And I I had really good results with that. And the only thing that kind of sticks with everybody is the you know how you do a warp drive because that's the that's the always the one that that hits everybody. So basically, I took uh, the uh, I, I'm not gonna pronounce his name because somebody's gonna ding me on it. But the the Mexican physicist who had uh, proposed his warp drive, I kind of did a another line of evolution from there. Um, I've got a, I've got a background in aerospace, and so the the ship construction was fairly straightforward for me. But the yeah the actual science of the weapons and the engines and the power plants were all just what do we have now even if it's just theoretical, and then just try to draw a straight line to where where do I think in 400 years we'd be with that. So, so, so that's actually something I, was, I just thought, thought about as well. So this theoretically could be our future 400 years from now. That's kind of how I wanted to base it. So uh, in there, you know, some very important leaps that let us colonize plants hundreds of light years away, but also some very stark limitations that cause us to get our butts kicked when we, you know, run to a, a more advanced species. So... All right, good deal. Yeah, so I was kind of wondering, like, okay, is this are you like maybe just like an alternate reality, or just like a brand new world altogether, uh, or yeah. could this conceivably be us, like somewhere down the line? Yeah, Black Fleet was based. Uh, it was what do I think possibly in 450 years from now? What would, what would we be like? Where would we be at? You know, under you know some best case scenarios and some setbacks. So. Uh, it was really cool to be able to plan all that. Out. I'll bet that must have been fun. You know, mapping all that out on your whiteboard. It, it was. It was a lot of fun. Do you, do you, okay, here's another a question for you. Did, like, did your significant other come in and say, I don't get it. Now, how would you make <laughs> that work or how that work? Or what, what would you think about doing this and like just agreeing with you, disagreeing? I mean, have you, have you ever had any like disagreements with her? Uh, she, it's kind of like, she, she likes the Omega Force series. Uh, she basically, like a lot, but she fell in love with the characters of that. So when I was starting this new series, I think there was a little bit she felt I was being disloyal to the other series, so she uh, was like, aggressively disinterested in, in when I was first bringing out Warship. And so uh, <laughs> I like that term, cool. aggressively disinterested. <laughs> I uh, and I, I kind of 
was keeping myself because I was uh, I talked to some other people and I was telling them I was wanting to prop up a whole new series after you know having pretty reasonable success with the Omega Force books. I was going to just you know cut and go to something else. They kind of looked at me like I was insane. So I was like, well, I'll just kind of keep this under my hat for a little bit and see if it flops, and I'll, I'll apologize. And if not, you know, we'll go with it. Good deal. All right. Uh, well, those are my questions here. Let me go ahead and pass you back over to Lindsay and ask you a couple marketing stuff. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I know who I'm going to talk to when I need a spaceship design for uh, my space <laughs> opera series. How are you with uh, airships? You ever design any of those with your background? Uh, nothing that would actually fly, probably. <laughs> All right. Well, let's jump into the marketing stuff. I'm sure people are very interested to know. Um, in case I didn't mention it, Joshua's got like hundreds of reviews on all of his books, and I assume he's making a few dollars on the sales. So you should probably listen to what he has to say. <laughs> <laughs> or or don't. That's what uh the, <laughs> the last interview I did. I had Simon uh, Whistler con completely confused. So. <laughs> yeah, I listened to that. I was out hiking, and you're like, yeah, I don't have a website. No mailing list. No, not really on social media. <laughs> so, well, let's talk about that. Um, you're really not out there on the web very much. I think I found you on Twitter when I was trying to find your email address. Yeah. Um, what What is the decision behind that? Is it just haven't gotten around to it? Or? Yeah, it, re it wasn't really. Uh, this, put it, this isn't part of the plan, but that way. Um, at the time when, up to I think book five at Omega Force, I was still working a full time job, and so a lot of it was, you know. Okay, do I sit down and do I sit on social media or do I try to write? And so the decision always boiled down to like, well, let's try to write two or three thousand words tonight, and then we'll do the other stuff later. And I've just never the other stuff never happened. And so <laughs> I do have a mailing list now, but uh, yeah, still no website and uh, still slacking on a couple other things. All right. Do you think <clears throat> do you think a lot of that is overrated based on your experience or? I I would have to say no because I've seen a lot of other people that use it very very effectively and so uh, it's you know my, my decision was strictly on time management but I've seen uh, a couple other sci-fi authors I know that are, have real strong social media presences and it, it seems to help them I, I see them pop up everywhere and then they get, they get included in the box sets and they get included in the conversations and so even if you're not working on a direct sale angle you always want to kind of be part of the conversation when somebody talks about space opera you want your name to be at least that top five that people rattle off Right. So let me ask you then, since you weren't out there, uh, how did you get your first sales and kind of get the ball rolling? Uh, I actually let's see. I'm trying to think of the time table here. Well, I published Omega Rising in very beginning of February of 2013, uh, and sales kind of floundered. I mean, it really didn't move that much. But to me, it was just the excitement of having it out there was fine. And then I did catch a really, really lucky break, and uh, horror author Brian Keane read my book and reviewed it on his website, and I saw this huge spike in sales that coincided right with the second book coming out. And I could never really account for it. I found out months later that that's what happened. And uh, it was it was kind of embarrassing because I just thought, well, I don't know what everybody's complaining about this self-publishing. It's uh, kind of easy. It just happens. And then I found out that, like, well, no, your book had been re reviewed on Brian's site. And so uh, I tried to kind of capitalize on that, and that's why I started – you know, trying to build the Twitter following and, and getting the Facebook page out there and, and you know promoting ads and that. So, right. So, did you would would you say that the Omega Four series was kind of a hit from the beginning, or has it become more popular since the Blackfeet Fleet stuff took off? Um, it was it did pretty well. Uh, I'd say by book three, the Omega Four series was what I would consider self-sustaining. Uh. I wasn't having to go back and and make the first one free anymore, and or, or push it on free days. When back when uh, you know, back when we were doing the Kindle Select thing, and uh, by book four and five, it really seemed like it kind of had a life of its own. Now I do have a, a the omnibus out. Books one through three are for sale in a, in a bundle, and, and as soon as the first Black Fleet book came out and kind of really broke out, then I noticed a huge surge in sales on that. So. They have been feeding off each other in a way that I don't think if I had just stuck with writing a mega force would have happened. Yeah, I would. I just definitely say just from looking at the covers, I haven't checked out the books yet. That it, it kind of might appeal to a different type of like the mega force books kind of look a little lighter, and then they, you got these scary giant spaceship on the other yeah, ones. Yeah, it's yeah the mega force even and it was it was a deliberate choice by me. But even the the name and the covers, I can understand a lot of people look at this and they probably like, well, I don't know it. It's a little juvenile looking, so I don't know if I want to spend my three dollars on this. 
And so uh, I think probably with the more serious series and people enjoyed Warship, then they went back like, well, okay, now I'll, I'm willing to risk the couple bucks to get get this one. And a lot of that was crossing. You have two different types of audiences. You have the uh, the adventure sci-fi people who who kind of like the Omega Force stuff in the beginning, but then when Warship came out, the more serious hard science fiction readers read it like, well, I'll, I'll give this other one a try. And it hasn't been uh, a total success. I mean, there were a lot of bad reviews where the people who liked the hard sci-fi stuff said, what, what the hell is this? This is ridiculous. So, uh, but it's it's been overwhelmingly positive trying to you know, use both series to prop each other up. Yeah, I think that comes to just with more popularity and more people finding your stuff is that people try it who might not necessarily be your perfect audience. <laughs> yeah. Okay, with prices, it looks like you're keeping them pretty low for the novels, like two ninety nine or three ninety nine. Mm-hmm. It's not, have you played around with that a lot, or um, the three ninety nine jump? I actually, well, I went back and back priced uh, books one through three are all priced at two ninety nine, um, and then I priced everything else past three ninety nine. I had messed around or thought about going to four ninety nine on a couple, on like maybe the next Black Fleet book. Um, I haven't made a, a firm decision yet, and a lot of that is uh, my novels typically weigh in around 85,000 words. And so I've kind of, I felt like 399 was probably a fair price for that. But then I'm kind of seeing where I'm getting left behind where a lot of people are moving the 499 range. And that's, when you're pricing your books out, you know, if you sell 20,000 books and you tack another dollar on that price, that's that's significant on your, your bottom line. So, you know, it's always something to think about to follow what everybody else is doing. You don't want to be priced so low that you seem, you know, cheap or, you know, a reason why you, you're you're down the bottom. Yeah, definitely. Um, and you mentioned that you were in KDB Select for a while. Do you think doing the free days helped out, helped you get some um, recognition? Yeah, right at first. Uh, when book two came out, I put book one free a couple times. And each time I got, you know, you could see on the graph, and with only two books, it's easy to plot this out. You could see a definite surge in sales. You know, you get a lot of downloads from book one, then book two, you inevitably get probably, I was getting maybe 30 40%, you know, crossover for, for the purchase of the next book. So, cool. Have you done anything with um, the other stores trying to pick up ground and or done any advertising to help out there? I uh, I had beat my head against Walt Barnes and Noble for the first. I think I pulled all the Omega Force books back out of Barnes and Noble because it was just. I mean, we're talking twenty sales, you know, compared to thousands on Amazon. Like I couldn't figure out. I don't. I didn't understand how to get these these Nook readers or where to even... And you would go to the Nook site, and, and you'd, you'd have to type in the exact title. I mean, it was hard to even navigate to find your own book when you knew what it was. And so I kind of said, well, let's just stick with Amazon for now. And then uh, I was invited to be part of a box set, uh, Stars and Empire, and a lot of the authors in that box set had a really strong Barnes & Noble presence. Uh, Jay Allen was one of them, has a really good, you know, being in sales. And after that... That came out in my first Omega Force book, was including that box set. I went ahead and put it, everything back in Barnes and Noble, and that's it's kind of been slowly gaining traction since then. Um, I'm getting ready to put everything out on iBooks, and I don't know. I've been kind of Kobo is kind of in this weird state of flux right now, so I'm not sure if I'm going to go that route or not. Alrighty, well, I think that I'm going to pass you after the guys. I know a couple of them had questions about the box set, so I will. Leave that for them. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Joe. All right. Um, first, I have to say uh, some. Well, actually, the first thing I want to say is that uh, it looks like on the wall behind you there's a poster. Uh, yeah, you... that's very self-serving, and that wasn't on purpose. But uh, in my office, I just moved. I'm kind of setting everything up, and when the webcam first came up, I was like, "You gotta be kidding me!" I, I'm the guy that has a poster of his book on the wall behind him. <laughs> <laughs> I would do it too if I had one. <laughs> look at how much of my like. I mean, if you see, look back here. That's a stack of stuffed animals I've made. Except for that, that's a goomba. <laughs> that's not mine. But uh, uh, did you like have posters made, or you just happen to have a poster? <laughs> I uh, I like the cover for Worship so much that I actually had posters made for that and did them as uh, giveaways to some readers. Because I've had uh, I don't have kind of a formalized beta reader system, but I have some readers that have been on my my Facebook page that have kind of stuck with me since the beginning. And I'll contact them and say, if I send you a PDF, can you give this a once through and, you know, I'll do something for you. And so uh, that's how that worked. And then when they came in, the quality was pretty decent. I'm like, well, I'm keeping one for myself then. Yeah. Uh, I, as people who watch the show regularly know, I, I tend to put my book cover on things. 
<laughs> I keep on glancing <laughs> over at my stack of bookmarks I just got. But uh, we'll we'll just we'll start with your book cover stuff then. Uh, you've got I got a call, what I would call really top notch series branding, particularly uh, the Omega Force covers. They're instantly recognizable as part of a series. the The series name is more prominent than the name of the novel or or your name. Right. Do you think that's contributed to the strength and long? Like, do you think that that helps sell through? I think it does. Um, and my cover artist and I, we always work with each one new one comes out. We try to think of a a color scheme for the, the upper lower panes of the of the cover that are going to grab so that everybody knows when they see in the also bots like oh a new one came out let me go ahead and get that uh, or at least put it in my wish list um, yeah it was the guy that he, I found him right when I needed a cover for book two and uh, he kind of developed this when I explained to him what the series is about he put the the series was prominent and then the subtitle was very small and he had kind of two action panes and I I absolutely loved it and so we've kept that throughout consistent. Because like you said, you, when you see it, it's, it's instantly recognizable. I mean, if you can't even read it, you see the silver middle bar there, and it's, you know, it yeah. grabs you. Yeah, that's something I, I've always tried with my stuff, too. I, I've stuck with the same cover artist for almost all of my books, mm. and I we, we, we try to make sure that each series that I've got, and I've got a few now, has, like, you can tell looking at them side by side, if you saw a, a row of all my books, you'd be able to quickly sort it into series. So mm. I feel like... Particularly with a long series, if people can tell at a glance that it's new and that it's part of the other thing, those are the two prong attack to making sure that uh, the thumbnail is still selling your books. Oh, definitely. That I mean, you know, cover. I, I don't care what everybody says. People cover shop when they look for books, oh, yeah. and then on dovetail into that, cover branding is very, very important for your series. If you want people to to recognize that when you come out the new one, don't completely change your cover up because when people are glancing through these things really quickly, you you. You'd be able to have them pick that out, you know, have a lineup. So, yeah, um, yeah, covers are super duper important. We've talked about it a lot in the past. I wrote a, a I wrote a guest post for someone one time about how covers are the icing on the cake. <laughs> but um, all right, so the other thing I want to say is you have got, as as Lindsay mentioned, a tremendous number of uh, got a tremendous number of reviews on most of your books. You've got consistently high number of reviews. And I want to know, do you do anything specifically to uh, to pursue reviews, or is that just a result of high sales? Uh, it's a result of, I guess, in the back half, the later part of this, when this, uh, probably late 2013, early 2014, it was a result of just high sales. I've never actually actively solicit reviews because I'm always nervous that if it's not a good one, it's like, well, you asked for that. Um, and then I, I found what's happened is that people discover the series as it's going more long running. I think people were kind of like, well, this keeps popping up. Let's try it. And a lot of the, the books that didn't have a lot, like books one, two, and three are now really starting to, to come up too. So, but uh, right. yeah, they, it was like, I think books one, two, and three, I, it, they didn't break a hundred reviews for the first year and a half I was published. So yeah, uh, it's, it's funny because it's one of those things where if you if you want reviews, I, I uh, on more than one occasion I'm thankful that my fans have been nice enough to do so. I've had to pursue reviews for things that uh, I know a ton of them read, but they simply just didn't review. And it's like it's important that people realize uh, if you like a book, review it. If you don't like a book, maybe don't review it. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, reviews are super important because they build confidence. Like if you. The, the, the first two things you're going to see, the first one is the cover, as we mentioned, uh -huh. and the second one is the number of reviews. And it's yeah. like, well, this one's got two reviews, and they're both five-star. This person got their friends to review it. Exactly. Right? And so, I did get through some frustration with that, where trying to – and I really wasn't sure how to you know, come across on social media, I guess my only platform at the time, to ask for reviews. But, yeah, you would see your sales, and you see other authors that have – 20 reviews after their release date, and I'm like, I've got five reviews two months later. It's like, well, what the hell? <laughs> like, I know a lot of people read it at least, but yeah, it's uh, yeah. So if although we're primarily uh, our audience is authors, if if you're a reader out there and you like stuff, please review it. You make us feel good, and you actually make <laughs> us allow you're know, able to continue doing this as a job. But uh, yeah, I guess those are the two main points I had to ask about. So now I'm going to hand you off to Jeff for uh, for his marketing questions. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All righty. So have you really done much advertising then, like Facebook or book bl book blurb or anything like that? Um, no, would be the short answer. Uh, I, when a release comes out, first thing I do is uh, I will. Well, now you have to. You have to boost the Facebook post, otherwise the way even your own followers don't even see the thing. Um, I had a lot of I had some of the cheaper Fiverr ads like uh, I think 
B Nights was one that I would use a lot, which has kind of started to fall off lately. I, I haven't seen a lot of return on that. Um, and I've got I've got a list. I I kind of hit all the ones that you would see everybody like fussy librarian, but uh, I never had a book that qualified for BookBub at a time that would have made sense to pay that much for an ad. So I never used them and got that that hard jump start of you know a couple thousand downloads at a time. Um, yeah, it's kind of maybe you know if I ever decide to to put out a, a new series or if I have some I'm, I've kind of always wanted to experiment with that, but uh, it's it's been the the simpler cheaper stuff so far. All right, and are there any of those types that you've experimented with that has had a surprising amount or effect on your sales? Actually, yeah, um, AskDavid.com, which I think it used to be free, but I think you got to pay like ten dollars now to get into the system, and then it's free after that for you. I see an immediate response every time I I post a book on that site, and it's it's always really surprising because it was kind of one of those things that you I listed as an afterthought, and then every time, like as soon as I I, I can tell when it's got Put on their front page because I'll see a big spike, uh, you know, in my rankings and in sales. So, askdavid.com. Oh, that's a yep. new one on me. I haven't heard of that one. And and conversely, is there anything you've tried that flat out is not worth it? Uh, I have to look. At, well, I got a spreadsheet here somewhere. There's a couple of the the mid list stuff, like the sixty seventy dollar per per ads or per mailing list mentions. I've I feel like that was just throwing money down a hole. Like I saw no response out of that, and I kind of try to when I experiment with ads like that, I try to stagger them so I can even I can tell if they're having an effect or not. Because if, if you do six at once, it's like well, if there may have been one really good one, or you know, so yeah, that makes sense. But okay, and you mentioned you just started using a mailing list. I mean, mm -hmm. what have you found to be the most effective means to increase that number? I mean, do you offer incentives, or do you push your newsletter on? Uh, I would say blog posts. Post, but we know you don't have you don't have a blog <laughs> as of yet. <laughs> Author notes and books, stuff like that. Uh, I went back to all the books have the length of the mailing list. Um, I push it pretty hard on Facebook, and then I'll offer. Um, I've got some Omega Four short stories that are we're talking probably twenty five thousand word short stories. And uh, the original thought was these were scenes and snippets that were I wrote because they were either humorous or I thought they were cool, and then they never really fit into a book. They either got chopped out of a book or I never put them in. And so my original thought was like, well, I'll add, I'll make an anthology of Omega Four short stories sometime. But now what I've decided to do is start, you know, on the let's say biannual newsletter, including these files or, or download link to these these uh, Omega Four short stories. So the thought is that if you offer exclusive content, you're more likely to get click through on the on the newsletter. So so if I understood that right, so, so extra scenes or whatnot that don't really fit the bill are twenty five thousand words long that you cut out of your book. Yeah, well, they, I, I kind wow. of pushed. I kind of pushed up to that. Like, there were there were scenes that like I kind of fleshed out into. Well, I guess that's beyond. I guess you would call it a novella at that point. <laughs> Crazy. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so, would you recommend to new authors to try bundling their books with other authors as a means of further exposure? Or, like for instance, I've seen a lot of these you know, like these books that have like. Uh, these bundles that say they have like 15, 16, you know, fantasy stories or sci-fi uh -huh. stories. I mean, is it worth it, or would you consider, if you were going to bundle, try and look for someone that has a lower amount of number of books in it, so you don't get lost in the mix? The probably exactly what you said. The the lower number of books, the better. Um, be be conscious who you're being bundled with. If you have 20 brand new authors, you might not get the res you're not gonna get uh, a big draw. Um, when we did Stars and Empire, it, I was approached by uh, Andy Webb, and he had a compiled a list of authors. It's like, oh wow, I know these guys sell a lot of books. I know that they have readers that don't read my books, so I kind of jumped in with both feet on that, and uh, it had a, a really big positive effect on things. It got it really got things rolling because I had people who would have never touched Omega Force before, kind of giving it a try. And if you know, if you can catch them in that first little opening scene of a book, then they'll they'll go ahead and read it, and it it really kind of Open things up for me. Nice. Yeah, it wouldn't make too much sense if you have a whole bunch of newbies all out there at the same time, yeah. trying to bundle together, and then like say, oh, well, we, we can just offer more books for the same price. Yeah, you, you want to try and find someone who's been out there, has a little bit of a following, has a little yeah. bit of a draw, so you can get going that way. That yeah, we sense. had, you know, we had Michael Bunker, we had Jay Allen, uh, you know, nice. just a, a bunch of the bunch of the bigger guys at the time that were, uh, you know, so was, and it's like I said, try to. If you're if you're gonna bundle your book, and you know that the books that you're being bundled with are all your readers anyway, well, chances are that these people have already read your book. So it's yeah. you know I'm not saying like 
don't go into a romance bundle with your space opera, but if you can find something with a little bit of variety, that, that seems to help. Yeah, I, I hear that. But uh, Alrighty, uh, I think that's actually it for my marketing questions. Let me pass you back over to Lindsay. All right, well, we're just about done here. Uh, I would like to ask in parting, do you have any advice for new, author new authors starting out right now? Uh, I'll, I'll tell you what I did uh, as far as... I mean, it's good to to solicit advice and to to read the blog posts and read the sites, but try to actually write your story in a bit of a vacuum. Don't read other other books that are successful and think, "Well, I'm going to try to emulate parts of this." You know, write your story and then worry about marketing it later. Because if you're trying to, if you're if you're marketing or you're worrying about sales, or you're worried about pursuing you know readers before you've even sent this thing to the editor or you know edit it yourself, then I feel like you're kind of hurting yourself before you even start. Um, but other than that, I mean, that's just the, the the same old cliche of, you know, writer's right. Before anything else, before you worry about marketing or how many sales you think you might get on this first project, you got to write it. So every day, sit down and, and write however much you can, whether, whatever your, wherever your goal is, hit it. Yeah, definitely makes a lot of good sense. I know I've been to, like, meetup groups for writers, or I should say for self-publishers and people talking about meet up, you know, how to do better on Facebook or something. Mm -hmm. And half the people would be like, yeah, I have an idea for a children's book, so I wanted to come to this meetup because, you know, <laughs> like, maybe you should finish something first and publish it, and then this will probably apply to you more. But, exactly. But no, I, I think it's great to listen and get prepared, but I definitely agree with you that you just have to write your own story and not worry too much about the trends or <laughs> what's popular right now. Yeah, because by the time you're done and ready to sell it, the trend's going to pass you by. It'll be gone, and, you know, you're going to be the the tail end of something that's already kind of run its course. So. All right. Well, where should people go to find you since you're not on a <laughs> website and uh, to check out your books? Um, if you go to, well, I'm on, you know, the Amazon page, uh, all the books are listed or they're on Barnes and Noble too. Um, my Facebook author page and my Twitter account, I will answer messages I get. And uh, I, I watch that pretty, and it's a few times a day. I'll cruise through there and see, you know, if somebody's posted something or asked a question or so. All right. Well, I will put links to your uh, sites, I guess you could call them, social media <laughs> presences exactly. and, and Amazon page in the show notes for anyone who wants to check them out. Right. Thank you for coming on and answering all our questions. Oh, thank you for having me. Thanks for the info, Joe. <laughs> Joshua, Joe. I don't know why I said that. All these J people on this show. <laughs> yeah, tell me. I'm Jeff, Joe, Joseph, and then there's Lindsay. <laughs> That's almost a J. They're close in the alphabet. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Everyone, take it easy. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye.